All right, guys, welcome to CCC. Um, today, we're going to be continuing in our series through the book of Galatians. And as you just saw, the passage was a pretty long one, but we'll try and get through it in a timely manner. Uh, but before that, let me just make one more announcement. Um, after service today, we're going to have a membership class. A membership class is just a time where I'm going to tell you guys more about the church, and it's a time where um, you guys can come and get to know more about the church. And we're going to be meeting in that corner, and we're going to be studying certain things about what, who Covenant City Church is. If you'd like to get to know us more, please join us. Uh, we've ordered extra food. Last week, there was a shorted food because more people came than we thought. Uh, but I promise you, we'll have plenty today. You can even have two if you want. Um, and it'll be, it'll be on that end. Um, so join us. And there's people who have signed up already. But if you haven't signed up and want to join, that's all right. Just come and, come and check it out. Uh, we'd love to have you there. All right. So as I've said, today's sermon is a continuation of our Galatians series. And right now we're at Galatians chapter 3, verse 15 to 29. And by the way, we're over halfway through the book of Galatians. So you guys are like experts now in this whole book, right? Um, and hopefully we'll be on track to be done uh, by December. So in our passage today, we see the Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote this letter to churches in a region called Galatia, we see him doing what he's been doing throughout the whole book, which is defending the central and most pinnacle truth. The truth of what Scripture says is man's way of being reconciled with a holy God which is the gospel. So the first few chapters, we've seen Paul combat a group that we've seen called the circumcision group, right? The circumcision group is a group that came to this region of Galatia and started preaching something opposite to the gospel. They started preaching legalism. Legalism is saying this, you are saved, you can be a part of God's people, you can experience a deep, meaningful relationship with the Holy God by obeying the legal requirements of the law. When you are able to obey the law, you will be God's child. That's what legalism says. And Paul says, no. This is a misinterpretation of the purpose of why God gave us his laws. And this is not what is taught in Scripture. He says our standing with God does not hinge upon our ability and strength to obey him. In this passage, he continues to say that this misunderstanding happens because we have taken God's law out of the context of his redemptive plan. We've taken God's laws, God's commandments for his people out of context of his, as we've heard, promise, his plan. A promise that we'll learn more about later, but for now, let me just say, stands for you and I here today. A promise that puts before us the, most single, the single most important thing that anyone can ever offer you, which is a deeper, more meaningful, life-changing, and everlasting relationship with the living God. Quite literally. What can be more important? So let's dive into our passage today and hope that we're going to grow in our understanding of what God's law is meant to do and how it's supposed to point us to Christ, to this promise, and how we're further to be changed by this promise of love. I want to point out three things from our passage today. One is how God's promise reveals his plan. Two, how God's promise defined his laws. And three, how God's promise shapes our lives. How God's promise reveals his plan how God's promise defines, defines his laws, and how God's promise shapes our lives. Let's pray before we jump into our first point. Lord, as we study your word um, in, in, in its context that you have given us through, uh, help our minds that we're able to reasonably um, approach it and you, for you are a reasonable God. And at the same time, let it not just be an academic exercise, but let the truths in which you have given us be processed also in our hearts, that we may worship you more, that we may see what your redemptive plan is for your people. And Lord, uh, open our hearts, open our minds, give us eyes to see and ears to hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's jump into it. The first point, how God's promise reveals his plan. 
There's something beautiful about a promise that perseveres through the test of time. A promise that stays true, faithfully kept by the one who made it. Why? Because it shows us the love and commitment that the promise maker has to the one who is receiving the promise. In 2013, a story in Huffington Post, which is a popular uh, news um, institution abroad, uh, told a story about a 70-year-old couple named Bill and Loretta. Bill and Loretta has been married for 50 years. And unfortunately, in their 41st wedding anniversary, they found out that Loretta has Alzheimer's disease, which is a disease that attacks the brain and the memory. And she can't do anything. This um, decapitated her, really, from changing her clothes, from taking a shower, from feeding herself, from brushing her teeth, from doing anything. And Bill, the husband, had to do everything for her. The online article includes a video of this couple, and they interviewed Bill. And in this video, we hear Bill say, in his weathered 70-year-old man voice, he says this, I don't count it a burden, whatever, to have to care for her. I'm quoting word for word. I have to do everything from the moment she wakes up to the moment she goes to bed, clean her teeth, shower, dress, everything. But it's a privilege. I count it a great privilege to love and to care for this woman whom I've loved all these years and continue to love. This man then continues to say, I'm determined to care for her every need every need, because she is my princess. Bill died a few years later, and he left everything, everything he had left uh, um, as an inheritance for Loretta to pay for the rest of her treatments. Bill's love for Loretta was so all-consuming that his friends often said that everything Bill does is always connected to Loretta. And actually, at times, things that Bill does or did won't make complete sense until it is understood in light of his love and commitment to Loretta. This article opened with this sentence, more than ever, the promises and vows they made 50 years ago are being tested in sickness and in health, in good times and in bad. There is something beautiful about a promise that perseveres through the test of time because it represents the love that the promise maker has to the one receiving the promise. In our passage today, Paul shows us that God long ago made a promise. Sorry. God made a promise to us. God made a marriage vow, if you want to say it that way, because God's people, the church, is often described as the bride of Christ. And in this passage, God tells us, like Bill's friends said about Bill in the interview, that unless we understand everything God does in light of the context of his love for his people, unless we understand everything God does in light of um, the perspective of his promise made, his vow, his love made to his bride, which is the church, which is us, we're going to misunderstand. We won't really get what he's trying to do, including the act of him giving us his laws, his commandments. Him giving us his laws, won't, we won't understand what that's all about until we see it under the redemptive plan of God's vow to us, of God's prom promise. Look at verses 15 to 16. As Paul talks about this promise that God made to us long ago. This is his vow. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, which is another word for promise for an agreement, with a, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it, no one breaks it, or adds to it once it has been ratified. A covenant is a vow, is a promise, is an agreement that people in the Old Testament used to make with each other. Okay? Paul is saying, even with man-made promises, even with man-made agreements and covenants, no one breaks it. And he describes God's relationship with us as based upon a promise, a covenant, a vow. So when did God make this promise to you and I? When did God make this promise to us? Well, Paul here was referring back to Genesis 12. It's the promise that God made to Abraham. God promised us something when he promised Abraham something in Genesis 12. The promise to Abraham was a promise to us. Abraham was the biological father of a nation 
who will then become called, be called God's people, right? God's people in the Old Testament was who? Israel. Who did Israel come out of? Abraham. It was Abraham's offspring, Abraham's descendants, right? Um, and God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. Let's just read verses 2 and 7, just for simplicity's sake. This is his promise. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. This is the promise. And I will make you a great nation, which later will be Israel. To your offspring, Israel, I will give this land. He said, Abraham, leave this country, which was Ur, leave this country, go to the land that I'm promising you, and I, I promise you, this is my vow to you, Abraham, Christians, that I will make you a great nation, and I'll make you, I'll give you offspring, and, and, and that these, um, these offsprings will become a nation who will be the way of salvation, who will bless other nations. That's the promise. Now, and you see this in the Bible, you see Abraham, uh, uh, who had a son, Isaac, and then that went to Jacob and Esau, and then Dan, Naphtali, Judah, um, um, uh, Levi, and then all this ended up becoming the nation of Israel. That was God's promise. Now, it'll make sense of how it connects to us soon. Christianity, in a sense, is a continuation of this promise that God gave to Abraham long ago. That to become a Christian, the Bible says, that this is going to sound weird on the get-go, okay? But I, it'll, it'll make sense, I, I promise. Well, I hope. To be a Christian, the Bible says, to be included as God's promised people, we must, again, quote-unquote, in a sense, become an Israelite. Hold on. We must, quote-unquote, become an Israelite because Israel is God's people. So to become God's people, we must become an Israelite. This is why the Christians in Galatia, where this letter was directed to, who were often majority non-biological Israelites, non-Jewish people, they're being confused by the circumcision group, who are, by the way, Jewish, right? So here are Christians in a non-Jewish region, and here are Christians that come from Israel that are Jewish, and they came to this non-Jewish Christian churches, and they started preaching what Paul says a false gospel. They said, if you guys want to be Israel, if you non-Israelites want to be God's people, want to be Jewish, want to be Israel, you have to obey the laws that we obey, including circumcision. That's where they're called the circumcision group. If you want to be God's people, if you want to be saved, if you want to be, quote-unquote, Israel, you have to be like us. They even go beyond that. They say you have to eat what we eat, you have to drink what we drink, you have to wear what we wear, you have to do what we do. To be God's people, you must become an Israelite. And the Galatians were confused. And they started to become insecure about their own salvation. I mean, of course, wouldn't you be insecure? If your salvation, if your inclusion among God's people was dependent upon your obedience to the Old Testament law, wouldn't you be worried? Wouldn't you be anxious? I would every second, every day. If my salvation, if my inclusion of being God's people, quote-unquote Israel, is based upon how moral I am, is based upon how well I have obeyed God's laws, then I would doubt my salvation every day. And Paul here reveals something absolutely shocking. He says, actually, guys, the way to become, quote-unquote, Israel, the way to become included in God's people is not through the nation of Israel, is not to look more Jewish. That's not the way. What is the way? Look at verse 16. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring, singular. It does not say and to offsprings, plural, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. This is what Paul's saying. You want to be saved? You want to have a relationship with God? You want to become an Israelite? You want to become a part of God's people? Paul asks the Galatian church. Paul asks us here today. Don't look at the Old Testament law. Don't look at the nation of Israel. Look to Jesus. Paul's revealing to the Galatians that when God promised Abraham offspring, which is through the way we can become God's people, he's not saying Israel. He's saying Jesus, who eventually did come from the descendants of Abraham, who is Abraham's offspring. That's why if you read the book of Matthew, as we've said in our uh, sermon, I think, two weeks ago, the book of Matthew starts with the genealogy of Jesus, doesn't it? And guess whose son Jesus is? 
the son of Abraham. In our confession of, of faith earlier, who does it say Jesus was the son of? The son of Abraham. He assumed Abraham's seed. Paul is saying, you want to become a part of God's people. Don't look at the law. Don't look at Israel. Look to Jesus. Because this was ultimately referring to Jesus, the, defend, the descendant of Abraham. God's promise to salvation is found upon Jesus. It does not say unto offsprings, Israel, many people, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ. Okay, let me just reiterate what Paul is saying. God made a vow. He made a promise to you and I a long time ago. He made a love vow to his beloved bride. That one day, God himself, through the descendants of Abraham, will come as man. He will be born as one of us, and he will sacrifice himself. He will die on the cross for our sins and deliver anyone who would trust in this promise of love, no matter what nationality you are. You see, Paul is saying, you want to be saved? Don't look at the law. Don't look at Israel. Look to Christ. This is what Israel is about. This is what it means to be God's people by placing our trust in his promise he made a long time ago to Abraham, fulfilled years later on the cross. So now, no matter your nationality, no matter your occupation, no matter your gender, you can all be, quote-unquote, an Israelite. You can all be, quote-unquote, God's people. Okay? Look at verse 26 to 29. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. See, now nationality is not an issue anymore. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish. It doesn't matter if you're non-Jewish. It doesn't matter if you're Indonesian, if you're Chinese, if you're American, if you're, I don't know, whatever you are. It doesn't matter. Because everybody, every culture, every nation can become a part of God's people through Christ. There is neither slave nor free. Your occupation doesn't matter. What you do, what you don't do, how much money you make, what car you drive, none of that matters. Through Christ, you become God's people. There's no male or female. It doesn't matter what gender you are. You can all become sons of Abraham, or you can become the promised children of Abraham. You can become the ones receiving the inheritance from God. And if you are Christ's, for, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring according to promise. Anyone can be God's people. By the way, side note, this tells you that the gospel fights head-on against racism, occupationalism, and sexism. It says you are all one in Christ. You are all equal. And in Christ, you can become people of God. This was the plan all along. This is what salvation was about. Through the promised Messiah that he promised in Genesis 12, a vow God made to you and to me a long time ago, that he will come and he will die for your sins as one of the descendants of Abraham, in Christ, through uh, the descendant of Abraham. Now, if we have placed our trust in the salvation promise, if we have trusted that God does save us, that God does love us, not based on our obedience to the law, but based on what he has done for us and his promise, this is the natural question you and I should be asking. Why did God give us the law at all? What was the purpose of the Ten Commandments? What was the purpose of any commandment, really? If I can be saved through Christ, then why did God give us the law? Look at verse 16. Remember, the law was given to God before or after he made this promise to Abraham. After, right? In Exodus 20, right? When, when God gave the commandments. He made this promise to Abraham, verse 17 says, 430 years before he gave us the law. So if salvation plan A was through Christ, why did God give you the law? Why did God give us his laws? Which leads us to our second point, how God's promise defines his laws. Remember earlier we talked about Bill and Loretta. And his friends say that unless you understand Bill's all-encompassing love for Loretta, and unless you understand everything Bill does under the context of this all-encompassing love, you're often not going to really get what Bill's trying to do. Paul is saying this is the same with God's laws. Until you and I understand why God gave us his commandments, under the context, under this, under this overarching promise that God has given us in Abraham, unless it's viewed 
under the context of God's intense love for you and I, we're not going to understand what the law is about. That salvation is through Christ and Christ alone. Okay. The law was given by God not to distract us from the promise he gave to Abraham, but it was meant to intensify our longing for that promise. God gave us a promise, plan A. 430 years later, he gave us the law. And then now, Christ died, and we're thinking, if Christ was plan A from the get-go, why was there this weird plan B put in the middle? Why was, why was the law put in here if it was all about Christ? The law was meant to intensify our longing for plan A. If a renowned cancer doctor stopped you in the middle of the street, and he said, I have a miracle cure that can cure cancer right now. And I'm telling you that you need to drink it. It's legitimate. All world-renowned doctors approve it. It has passed the government drug safety test. And I have proof and testimony of its legitimacy. I promise you this medicine works. Take it. Would you take it? Probably not. Because you don't think you have cancer. What's the point of taking cancer medicine if you don't have cancer? You'll probably tell them, thank you, you're a very kind person, but I'm a little bit creeped out right now, and you need to go, right? But now, imagine this world-renowned cancer doctor came to you, and he said, I saw you from afar, and I am 100% sure that you have stage 4 cancer. You may not know it, but you have all the symptoms that tell me you have stage 4 cancer. And after he said that, he reached into his bag, and he took out two tablets of stones, which is weird. I don't know why he'd be writing in stone. It's really inefficient and heavy. But he took it out, and he said, here are a list of 10 things that normal people without cancer, not normal people, here are a list of 10 things that people without cancer can do. Can you do any of these things? And you take a look at it, and you think, my goodness, I can't do any of that. He's right. I have stage 4 cancer. And then, after we've been, our eyes have been opened to our sickness, then he says, here, I have a miracle cure. It's legitimate. All world-renowned doctors approve it. It's passed a government drug safety test. I have proof and testimony of its legitimacy. You must take it. I promise it will cure your cancer. What would you do now? You'd probably take it. Because the thing he showed you was meant to intensify your longing for your need of salvation. List of the symptoms. It intensifies your longing for the cure. See, like the doctor's list of symptoms, God gave us his law, Paul says, not to distract us from the original promise, but to intensify it, to show us our deep symptoms, our need of a savior, that we are indeed spiritually not only sick, the Bible says, but dead. We can't do any of the commandments, can we? God said, don't love anything else more than you love me. That means obey me above everything else. Have we been able to do that? I haven't. I have every day fallen in deeper love with something else other than God. First commandment, the second commandment. I've lied. I've hated others. We've all coveted, lusted. Six, seven, nine, ten commandment. On the daily. God's saying, look at your symptoms. Look at what you cannot do. Realize your deadness. Long for my promise even more. The law was given to us not to distract from plan A, not to distract us from the promise, but to intensify it. Paul uses a few analogies here in our passage to describe this effect of the law should have on us, which is verse 23. We were held captive under the law, he says, imprisoned until the coming of faith, or of Christ, would be revealed. The law made us realize, just like the doctor did, we are in need of help. We have been imprisoned. When someone realizes they're in prison, what do they long for? to be set free. They crave to experience liberty, which should lead us to the cross. Another analogy is verse 24. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. What does a guardian do? It guides us to the place we're supposed to arrive. It's not the end goal. It guards us. It guides us somewhere, which is Christ. The law guards us to Christ, the promised Messiah, plan A. The law was never meant to be option B. As if God promised us Christ, 
a long time ago, and then 430 years later changed his mind and said, law. That's not what happened. Law is not contrary to promise. This is what he means in verse 21 and 22. Read it along with me. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. But the scripture, the law, imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The law was not another option contrary to plan A. It was supposed to intensify our longing for plan A by revealing to us our imprisonment, our captivity, our spiritual deadness, our desperate need for plan A. So that our eyes are open to our need for Christ and intently ask, when will this promise be fulfilled? I need deliverance from this body of death. I need a savior. I am sinful. Help me. And then after that intensity comes, we look upon the cross and say, Amen. That's what the law is supposed to do. The law was not put by God as a salvation plan B that is contrary to salvation plan A, which is Christ. The law is a floodlight that beams radiantly so that our eyes can feast upon the promised cross. The law is a loudspeaker that our ears can unmistakably hear the tunes of this promised Messiah. Matthew 8, 18, Jesus asked the legalistic Pharisees in the New Testament, having eyes do you not see? And having ears do you not hear? What the law is actually all about. Summarize, Paul is saying this, God is not flip-floppy. He did not make a love vow to you a long time ago and say, I will love you, I will save you, I will die for you, I will make you mine, then go back on his word years later and say, never mind, here's the law, go save yourself. God is not flip-floppy. Do you not see, do you not hear that God made a vow to his beloved, to you and I, a long time ago, and on that cross, he kept it. He kept it. In pain and suffering and poverty and sickness, even to the point of death, he kept it. There is something beautiful about a promise that perseveres through the test of time because it represents the love that the promise maker has to the ones receiving the promise. And when man sees God's law in this light, when man understands God's laws under the context of his love for us, under the context of his redemptive plan all along, that changes people, that changes us, which leads us to our last point, how God's promise shapes our lives. When we see the purpose of the law, and it leads us to Christ, something happens. Paul describes this process in verse 25 as we put on Christ. Okay, let's read verse 25. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as, for as, many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, what does it mean to put on Christ? It means that when we have received this love vow God made and kept through centuries, we no longer belong to ourselves. Just as Tatiana and I no longer ultimately belong to ourselves the second we said, I do, on that altar. Gladly so. We now gladly live for the one who made that vow to us long ago and fulfilled it on the cross. The term putting on Christ refers to our obedience to him. Look at Romans 13, verse 12 to 14. Besides this, you know the time. The hour has come for you to wake from sleep. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. When we put on Christ, the night has passed and the day is at hand. In other words, Paul is saying, Christians, wake up. Wake up. Do you not see that when you received God's promise, do you not see that when you received Christ as Lord and Savior, God has taken us out of our pajamas and put the armor of Christ on us? Wake up. Now is the time for battle, not slumber, not sleep. Now is the time for faithful obedience to the one who has kept his promise to you. 
we have a new purpose when we, said, I, when we say, I do, to his vows, which is Christ. Stop gratifying the passions of the flesh. So when Paul says the law has no power to save, he doesn't mean throw it away altogether. Yes, salvation is through God's Messiah. Yes, salvation is through Christ. But the law is still to be revered in a sense that now, through Christ, we have been included in God's people, and the law is instructions of how to live as God's people. If I give you a chocolate bar, Snickers, I don't know. They have Snickers here? I'm sure they do. They give you a chocolate bar. Okay, they should. I don't know why I even asked that. Um, and, and it's free. I, I bought it for you with my own money at no cost to you at my expense. And I gave it to you, and I said, okay, I'm going to give you some commandments now. I want you to look at it. I want you to open the wrapper. I want you to bite it. I want you to chew it. I want you to swallow it. And I want you to repeat the process. The laws I just gave you were not, is not a way for you to earn that chocolate bar from me. I've given it to you for free at my own expense. The laws I gave you were instructions of how to enjoy the free gift more. You see, yeah, the law, you don't throw the law away. You revere it. It's God's laws. But it is not a way for salvation. It is an instruction for you of how to live as God's people, as those who have been saved, as those who have been included in God's people, as true Israel, New Testament says, which is no longer determined by a cultural boundary, but offered to all. We are not freed from sin into the slavery of self-indulgence. We are freed from sin into unrestrained obedience to Christ. Awake. Do you not see that you are clothed for battle? Obey the law. Fight sin. Not to earn salvation, but because through Christ, salvation is yours. That is plan A. See, the law intensifies our longing for plan A Messiah where salvation is found and instructs us of how to live for this Messiah in this new life we've been given. The law intensifies our longing for this promised Savior, instructs us of how to live for this promised Savior, but it was never put in place so that we can become our own saviors. The law intensifies our longing for this promised Savior. It instructs us of how to live for this promised Savior, but it was never put in place so that we can become our own Savior. Let's come to a close here. Remember the Galatians in this day, as we've uh, uh, preached before in the previous chapters, they were already Christians. They already received Christ in their life. They're already a part of God's people. Um, verse 15, Paul calls them brothers. Brothers implies one in Christ. They're brothers and sisters in, 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 the, in the people of God and in God's family. The biggest worry that the Galatian church has was not the question of how to be included as God's people, but it's how to maintain their place as a part of God's people. That was their worst worry. They were scared about these, this circumcision group that came to them and said, you, you're following who? Christ? No, no, no. You have to obey the law to earn your salvation. And these people who once were renewed by the gospel, they're confused. They're, they're, they're doubting their salvation. They're saying, my life has not been perfect. I've sinned every day. I've fallen short of God's laws every day. It, have I lost my salvation? Am I no longer part of God's people? And is this not the worry for us today? Is this not the question lurking in our minds every day when we wake up and maybe when we sleep? I have received the gospel, but my sin seems still so rampant in my life. I too often forget that I'm in battle and I fall back into slumber. What happens if I continually fail, which we all do? Will God stay faithful to his vows? Will God keep his promise? Will he grow tired of me and my constant failures like many of my human relationships have in the past? Will God keep his promise, his love vow to me? To that, friends, remember, God is not flip-floppy. He made this promise to us not after we've been obedient. He made this promise to us not after we've obeyed him. He made this promise to us long time ago, before we've done anything good or bad. Look at Romans chapter 9. For this is what the promise said. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, 
in order that God's purpose of election might continue not because of works, but because of him who calls. God in Christ did not make this promise to us because he was impressed by our obedience. God did not make this promise to us because you came to church this morning and only missed the confession of sin. God did not save you because somehow your morality has manipulated his love for you. He made you a vow. He made you a promise that he will be your God and that you will be his people. And no matter what you do, he loves you and on the cross he says it is finished. You are mine. I am yours. Because of this promised law, he will come to rescue you, to, to save you. And know that nothing you do can ever take the salvation away from you. Because it was never found upon your obedience in the first place. But on his promise that he will come to our rescue. And when we see this everlasting promise, this love vow he made to us long ago, fulfilled on that cross where his blood was shed for us, it will change us. It will shape us. As people who walk on this earth, faithful to our Jesus, whom has given himself for us. It will change us. Do not fall back into the burden of sin. When you wake up and you look at your life and you doubt God's love for you because of what you've done and what you haven't done, let God shout to you loudly through this passage and say, I love you. I have vowed myself to you. I have said I do to you a long time ago. And it is based on me who calls. And no one, no one will take that away from you, not even your own sin. Now, if we are in continual sin, if we have not yet been changed, the question isn't whether or not I've lost my salvation. The question is whether or not I truly have been saved in the first place. Whether or not God's love has truly changed my heart inside out and changed us. Have I put on Christ? That's the question. But once you put on Christ, that was done because the power of an eternal God that made a promise to you years ago. It's secure. You're saved in him. Let me end with the story of Bill and Loretta. This is how the interview ended. And I was surprised that a major newspaper included this because it was religious, and I was kind of like, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I was surprised that they, they went ahead and included this. But this is literally what Bill said at the end of this interview. I didn't twist or change a single word. Check it out yourself, Huffington Post. This is what he said. You see, God has loved us so unconditionally. And I understand that God has put his love in my heart. And because I realize how much God has loved me, that's how I too can love my lovely beloved wife. She has done so much for me over all these years, and now she can't and I can, and I can return love, her love to her. And it's a love that, well, to me, means I can do anything. Bill has put on Christ. Bill knows how secure he is in this love, and it empowers him to push forward in sickness, in poverty, to follow his own vow because of a vow that was fulfilled by God, made to him a long time ago. Friends, if you have received this promise, I hope that God's word today encouraged you and reminded you and that it may shape you further to be secure, to, to move in life knowing that his love for you is dependent upon what he has vowed to you a long time ago. If this is your first time hearing about this promise or about this gospel, I pray that you would continue to consider it, study it, look into it, research it. Because if this promise made years ago is true, then the God of this universe has been longing for you to see just how madly in love he is with you. And that's worth a few minutes of our study each day. There's something beautiful about a promise that perseveres through the test of time because it represents the intensity of love the promise maker has to the ones receiving this promise. Let's pray. Father, I see this, and I just often think it's too good to be true. And I think that why would the God of the universe love me so much and even vow to love me before I was even born? And Father, it's because to show us what we did in our confession of sin earlier, to make us truly understand and remember that it is not about us, but about you. 
And when we approach our God, salvation, this life we will lead for the next few years, in light of this promise that you have saved us because of everything you did, we will go around this world, we will live our lives as one in Christ and seeing that it's not because of what we've done, it's not because of our righteousness that we are in a relationship with you, but because of what you have done for us. You know what this does? This decreases us and this increases you. This humbles us and this glorifies you. And now we can say what Paul said in Ephesians 2, no one can boast but in the gospel. There's nothing I can brag about. I can't come to you and say, look what I've done, look who I am. I can only come to you and say, look at what you've done, look at who you are, that you would love a sinner like me. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Father, as we sing of this great love for one last time this Sunday, enter into our hearts continually, be with us, and remind us and shape us and put upon us the armor we have on already, that we are here for obedience to you, secured obedience in the love of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand up as we sing this last song.